Yes. Um, so good morning, hello, good afternoon, good evening to everyone that is tuning in for this session. I just decided to cover all spectrums of the time zone. Um, so it's our pleasure to have Chaitanya Churn again with us this Saturday. My name is Malvika, so a little bit about myself is that I graduated with my Bachelor's of Business Administration with a focus in human resources uh, last year. Um, I was part of a Bhakti Yoga and Meditation Club on campus as well, so that's where I got my sort of a deeper exposure into spirituality. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists and our speaker today. So we have Chaitanya Churn. So Chaitanya Churn is a mentor, a monk, a speaker. He has written a plethora of books on applied mindfulness and purposeful living. Um, he also has daily inspiration meditations from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, he's been invited to speak at world global economic forums, such as like um, World Peace Conference, UNESCO, um, other companies such as Intel, Google, Microsoft, just to name a few. And he gives 400 talks across 100 cities in four continents every year. So as you can tell, he's a very, very busy, jam-packed um, individual, but we're so grateful that he's been able to give us uh, his time this wonderful Saturday morning for us here in the West. Um, we have Tanujay. So Tanujay Saha is a PhD candidate at Princeton University. Um, he is doing his PhD in the field of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. And he did his undergrad at IIT Kharagpur, where he got introduced to various concepts of spirituality. And then last but not the least, we have the wonderful Masha. So Masha is currently on an internship at Meg Energy in Calgary, Alberta, which for those of you that don't know where that is, that's in Canada. Um, in the fall, she will be going into her final year of chemical engineering with a petroleum minor at the University of Calgary. Um, she's also the president of the Breathe Easy Meditation Club at the university, which focuses and helps individuals um, to connect to their breath and relieve stress. Um, she's also the president of the Petroleum and Energy Society, which is one of the biggest uh, student chapters in the Western Canada sort of um, part. And um, sorry, it's the Western Canada from the Society of the Petroleum Engineers. So we're very glad that Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, you're here with us today. Um, and we have Tanuja and Masha that are also joining us. Um, so I guess I wanted to start off the discussion by asking uh, a question. Um, so currently, because of everything that is going on with this pandemic, um, as everyone knows, we are looking forward to scientific ad advancement in terms of like development of vaccines, medicines, et cetera, um, to help us deal with whatever the situation is around us. So I think with this pandemic, it has opened sort of a broader mindset in terms of spiritual and spir scientific and spiritual advancement. So how would you perceive today's world with respect to science and spirituality? Yeah, it's a very important question. I would like to start by one broad statement. Science is the study of matter. And spirituality is the study of what matters. Mm. That study of matter means that how various material objects interact, whether it's the physical objects like Newton had when he saw the apple falling, or it could be in the context of today's pandemic, how chemicals interact, what how we develop a vaccine. So that's the study of matter. And it's extremely important because we live in the material world. To understand how matter works and how we can make it work for us instead of against us. That is what science does. Now, along with that, we also need another category of knowledge. That is the knowledge of what matters. What matters means that whenever we have to make decisions in life, there are various parameters to consider. Even in the current pandemic crisis itself when many of the world's economies shut down for some time, and now they're trying to open. So now there is a trade between saving people's lives and saving people's livelihoods. Mm. So this is, uh, which one do you view more important? Now, different people may have different opinions. And you, you really can't get a specific scientific basis for this kind of decision making. 
we for each of these we can get scientific facts but for us to make decisions we have to weigh those scientific facts and the study of what matters that is why for us to have the right hierarchy of values so for example tomorrow if a company develops a vaccine and they they decide to mint money out of it and they get a patent and they don't let anyone else use it and they consider earning money more important than saving people's lives now we will recoil against it and naturally we should but within the scientific method itself there is no basis for this recoiling albert einstein said that we can talk about the ethical foundations of science we can't talk about the scientific foundation of ethics ethical foundations of science is science being used ethically or not but ethics themselves are not something which science can tell us science can tell us how to do a how to do b how to do c but whether to do a b or c which is right and what is which is wrong that is something which science can't tell us so science is independent of morality it doesn't mean science is immoral nor is science moral science is what is called as a moral that means it doesn't have the moral damage it basically describes how this material element will interact with this material element and what will be result but whether this interaction should be done or not that is a different body of knowledge so of course ethics is just one branch of spirituality spirituality is essentially about find leading a life of meaning and purpose so what is it that brings meaning to our life and what is the purpose the meaning refers to broadly the overall world and what how do how do we make sense of it and purpose refers to what do i do in this world what is it that i am meant to so both of them are related because based if i am playing a part in a play and if it's a shakespeare play and say i am playing a bunny called like julius so julius caesar or okay. then i will play that part accordingly so meaning is what is going on purpose is what am i meant to do so spirituality provides us that understanding and because of the current pandemic uh, we are being forced to ask ourselves spiritual questions also what is what is humanity meant to do we were going about our lives quite smoothly and suddenly you no know, one tiny invisible virus has brought us to a standstill so it's uh, we, are, we are questioning humanity's position in the world not just our position in our particular social economic circle but humanity's position in the earth itself So we have lived to a large extent as if we alone matter on the planet we humans have lived as if we alone matter unmindful of the ecology unmindful of other life forms in many ways the wet markets in china are the most probable cause of the slaughter of animals today so now science itself cannot give us a definitive decision whether we should be slaughtering animals or not science can give us certain facts and those facts are useful very useful but the study of what matters so that is what spirituality is all about okay awesome thank you so much for answering that question um the nije i believe you also had a question you wanted to ask so take it away yeah um uh, thank you malvika uh so uh, my question is kind of related to the pandemic uh so right now a re- uh, highly popular opinion that is floating around is that um uh, people are praying a lot people are uh, praying to the uh, the gods of the different beliefs asking for uh, their uh, 
hard hardships to reduce but it's not it's not the prayers are not being answered and then uh, certain people say that uh, these prayers can only be answered by science and medical studies when the vaccine is developed so uh, if uh, our prayers are not being answered and if only science can bring a pause to these hardships then why is spirituality important and how is it relevant so could you please shed some light on the matter yeah, thank you. That question. Yes. Now, when we talk about spirituality, at least the way I presented it is more in terms of how we relate with the universe, how we relate with reality. Mm -hmm. So, spirituality can have an aspect of religion to it. Religion, religion broadly refers to certain practices that we do for maybe transforming ourselves, raising our consciousness. So if you consider, say, at two levels, there's a material level of reality, there's a spiritual level of reality. Right. It's like the bottom of the mountain and the top of the mountain. Right. So at the material level of consciousness, if we are, then we are quite self-centered, looking for material things for our own immediate gratification. But when we are at a spiritual level of consciousness, our consciousness is more expanded, more evolved, we can see the bigger reality and then we can belong to it more harmoniously. So the bottom of the conscious bottom of the mountain is material consciousness. The top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. And religion, if we want to use that word, although that word has a negative connotation today, the essence of religion is it's meant to be a practice to help us rise from material level to spiritual level. So what we do within our religious practices or whatever anybody does for spiritualizing their consciousness. That is what we could call as their religion. So in that sense, the purpose of religion is more to transform ourselves rather than to, to get some divinity to transform things around us. But that can also happen. But if that is the primary purpose where, with which we approach the divine, then it is like, I want to stay at the bottom of the mountain, but you just, you make things comfortable at the bottom of the mountain. That can also happen, but that's not the primary purpose of approaching a spiritual path. So, so prayer is not so, uh, so rather than pray, praying that, you know, that the divine clear the road for us, it's much more productive to pray that let the divine prepare us for the road. Prepare us for the road. Strengthen us from within. And going back to the earlier point of meaning and purpose, one of the teachings on the Bhagavad Gita, which is a ancient Indian spiritual text, it says that we are all parts of the whole. And we are meant to contribute in a mood of service and, con uh, service and devotion, playing our part in the home. So by, that's the first part, when we, if we approach spirituality or this particular practice of prayer as a means of changing things around us, that may happen, but that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to change ourselves. And uh, the second point is, with respect to science, spirituality does not in any way deny the importance of various specific branches of knowledge. Another way to put it is that science is what we live with. Spirituality is what we live for. There are means and there are purposes. The spirituality tells us about what is the purpose that we are living for. Now, it is material science and material knowledge that will give us the means by which we live for that. If we consider the Bhagavad Gita itself, it's an ancient text. And Arjuna had to, at that time, fight a war against antisocial elements. It disrupted the world and persecuting people. So then, at that time, he got the spiritual knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita, which gave him a vision of why he was doing what he was doing. But thereafter, when he had to fight the war, 
He fought it using the knowledge of archery that he had learned throughout his life. So his spiritual knowledge was not a substitute or a replacement for his martial knowledge, for his archery knowledge. So the spiritual knowledge and the material knowledge are meant to be, are meant to complement each other, not that one is the replacement for the other. So just as on one side, we pray or we do our spiritual practices to strengthen ourselves, we can also pray that things improve. That prayer is not a replacement for a vaccine. At the same time, a vaccine will also not be a replacement for gaining a life of meaning and purpose. We may live, but what are we living for? That no vaccine can tell us. So in one sense, each, each branch of knowledge has its own domain. And spiritual knowledge doesn't intrude on any other branch, any, on the domain of any other branch of knowledge. Rather, it underlies and guides us about how to use that branch of knowledge. So from a spiritual perspective, if we consider that there is a divine who is the source of everything, then eventually when scientists develop a vaccine, so we understand that the intelligence to develop the vaccine also comes by divine essence. The, uh, look at the major breakthroughs in science. They have not happened simply by a rational step-by-step -step analysis. That is definitely plays a part. But most of the significant breakthroughs in science happen by sudden inspiration leaps. And what is often called as intuition or inspiration. Now, Einstein, quote him again, he said that the, the, in, the intuitive mind is the real discoverer. And he said the rational mind is a servant. So those, when, especially when we get inspiration, it's almost as if the answer that we were seeking for is given to us from some source outside us, not physically outside, but inside only, separate from us. At one moment we don't know, and the next moment, hey, that's to be done. So that inspiration is not solely a result of human endeavor alone. There is an element of divine providence. So we don't have to see spirituality as necessarily uh, creating some kind of supernatural or miraculous intervention in the shape of things and thereby transforming them. It could, spirituality can change by giving us the strength to face the problems as they are present and by giving some of us the insight to solve the problems as that insight comes up. Mm -hmm. Up on like that, what you said, I wanted to ask, um, because like right now there's lots of contradiction I guess between like science and spirituality and saying that like both of them can't coexist together so like how do you see the battle between both of them do you have any specific areas in mind where you can, well like for example when you have um like even the way that like the world was created right the spirituality says that for example it was heaven adam and eve la la but science says that it was um like monkeys and evolution and everything so there's either people that believe one thing or people that believe the other thing and they kind of say there's no middle ground right so like what do you think about that okay yeah so with respect to the conflict within science and spirituality it comes primarily because science and spirituality talk in two different languages. And often the two talk past each other. If you are talking with me in Hindi, in English, and I'm speaking back in Hindi, and say, I don't know English and you don't know Hindi, then we might be talking and you might both get annoyed with each other. Why are you not understanding? Me? Mm -hmm. right. Just because of that frustration, we may start yelling at each other. Now, the problem is not that the two of us are necessarily disagreeing with each other. It is that we are just talking different languages. So, now what do I mean by different languages? Science, when it started, it 
there was a conscious decision that science will focus on the measurable material aspects of nature so science divided nature into broadly what is what are called as primary and secondary qualities so the qualities which were considered primary are those which are measurable length breadth velocity luminosity viscosity density like that all those are measurable and taste beauty mm, ethics love all these are considered secondary qualities and science decided to focus on the primary qualities and this was important and it was it led to incredible amount of breakthroughs at the same time that whatever we focus on often other things get relegated to the background so when that happens as science started getting more and more ability to discern newer and newer patterns of connections between various measurable aspects of nature the result was that there was a significant over confidence that science can answer all questions for example uh, when i say all all questions what questions can science not answer peter medever is a nobel laureate scientist and he said that so it would be arrogant for scientists to claim that the questions that science can't answer are not worth asking now what would be the questions say a simple example would be medical science now much of medical science is meant to free people from pain and yet with all our medical advancement we don't have any precise device for measuring pain we don't have a painometer we can have some pain scales to relatively try to assess but pain is a very real experience for us when we go through it at the same time we cannot put it on a mathematical scale so is it real then as far as our experience goes it is real you know many people can philosophize the about various things or some people can nihilistic and say this world is false but when they feel pain you cannot argue away your pain it is real so similarly another factor which is quite real for us is love we all want to love and be loved like one of the biggest fears in our modern or postmodern world is the fear of being rejected we enter into a relationship and what if we are abandoned or rejected now when people form a relationship they we when we enter into a relationship we all like to know whether this other person really cares for me really loves me uh, now suppose a boy proposes to a girl i love you please marry me now does the girl have access to a love meter that she can put on his heart let me see do you really love me if he had something it could take a lot of uncertainty out of the relationship but we can't do that and love is real we see it we, we have all experienced it we all want to experience it but again it's not quantified so the point is that science largely is based on math math means measure, measurable aspects of reality and that is important in its own way at the same time the world of science is not entirely the world we live in now when we if you if you meet someone say and then you go back and tell your friends i met a very interesting person today okay tell me something about him oh that person was 5 feet 2 inches and 150 pounds okay so that's not the most interesting thing about a person unless maybe we are in a career of modeling or something and that's what we want to get first generally we want to know their attributes their, their nature what are their interests what are, so the world of science the world of mathematical measurable uh, real me- measurable aspects of reality that is not the sole world we live in so what happens is that when so science talks primarily in the uh, language of math and science considers 
certain proper certain aspects of nature primary we in our daily experience do we consider those aspects as primary maybe maybe not for us when we want to eat food we we may want to know okay how much calories is this food going to be but that is not the only thing we want to know we want to know how it tastes so now taste is something which is quite real we want to experience it but at the same time again we don't have a taste meter to measure taste so science talks in the language of math if you want to talk about spirituality <laughs> it talks in the language of myth math and myth now the word myth has again a negative connotation which myth means something which is imaginary but that's not the primary connotation myth especially refers to stories that teach stories that have a foundational role within a particular tradition or a particular group or a particular group of people so when spirituality teaches it teaches primarily through narratives the word the myth makes us, i just wanted you i use the word myth because it's a good contrast with math and myth but if you uh, more if myth has the idea of uh, imagination or imagine being imagined let's look at the word narrative narrative so spirituality primarily teaches through narratives so now the narratives uh, telling stories is a way by which humanity has learned throughout history now when stories are told yes factual details matter but they are not the only thing that matter so with the factual details the essential point is that we tell a story for a particular purpose that we maybe we want to entertain we want to we want to inform so so spirituality speaks in a different language it's the language of narratives and now again to it's not that the narratives are not grounded in reality but the focus is different the focus is when uh, going back to the earlier point of spirituality is about the things that matter is the study of matter and the study of what matters the spirituality focuses on certain narratives that talk about people in the past how they have lived how they chose and why their cho- choices were right or wrong so through those narratives what matters and what doesn't matter is talked about and that is the that telling us helping us learn what matters how to live a life of meaning and purpose that is the primary purpose of spirituality so the two talk in different languages now as far as the specifics of say origin how things originated yes <clears throat> science and spirituality do have different understandings of origin and this could be a big subject in itself but i'll mention this briefly at this stage See, science begins with certain assumptions okay there is science and there is scientism scientism is the ideology that science is the source of all knowledge that whatever we can know it should be known only through science and whatever is not known through science is not worth knowing the science science itself is different from scientism in fact there is no scientific proof for scientism there is no scientific proof by which you can say that all knowledge worth knowing has to come only from science the so scientism is ideology now when science talks about the remote past the scientific theories about the distant past are in themselves nowhere as authoritative as scientific theories about how things work in the present in fact science uses entirely different methods for knowing about the past as compared to knowing about the present so for example consider the classic uh, newtonian example of a apple falling down some people say it fell in front of him some people say it fell on him whichever way 
Now, based on that, it is Newton's brilliance that he came up with the theory of gravity. So significantly, how did he come up with the theory? Okay, he saw this apple falling. Will another apple fall? Will another object fall? Will it fall somewhere else? Will different people also get, get objects to fall at different places? So basically, this is the inductive method. The inductive method is where we take one issue, one particular event and we subject it to repeated experimentation to see if, if we can discern some pattern in the repeated experiments. So most of the scientific breakthroughs or most of the science that has transformed the world by providing us technology and other things, that has come from the inductive method. So we do repeated experiments, although specific experiments can be very different depending on the field. So for example, if we want to develop a vaccine, how would we do that? So we develop something and see if it works. Maybe we'll try it on non-human subjects, then we may carefully try it on human subjects. And when after sufficient repetition, we find a positive result, then we can say this is a vaccine that works. So this is repetition. So science, when it, so we all have certain faith in the power of science, and we have a certain because of that faith, we believe that what science says is authoritative. But our faith has been derived from scientific findings, derived from scientific findings that came from the inductive method. However, when science starts talking about origins, it uses a different method. It, it can't use the inductive method because how can you repeat? How did a particular species come about? How did life come about? How did the universe come about? We can't repeat that at all. So the method that is used is called as abductive method. Abductive method means that it's an inference to the best explanation. Okay, maybe the, this was like this over there, this was like this over there, this was like this over there. So it's something like a who done it mystery novel. So there is a person who was alive at the at eight o'clock when their butler went to see them. And then 10 o'clock when somebody else, when the butler went back again, the person was dead. Who killed him? You can't get the thief, please come back and kill so that we can catch you on camera. Then in those two hours, you try to find out. Okay, who else came in the room? Was there a camera over here? Do you see anybody go inside? Okay, this child went inside. But that, that knife that was put in the stomach of the person, child couldn't have the knife, it requires too much strength. Okay, then there was this old lady who went in. And uh, I mean, she just she may not have so much strength. Okay, that butler himself went in again. And did the butler do it? So basically, we try to come to a best explanation based on evidence. And this, this is based on certain knowledge that we have. Now, we may not know that maybe in their house, under the bed, there is a trap door. And somebody sneaked into the trap door, killed and went back. So when we use abductive method, it is highly speculative. And in that sense, it is nowhere as authoritative as our knowledge, acquired, scientific knowledge acquired through inductive method. So we may use the same label science for everything, but not all science is born equal. Science, uh, this comes from inductive knowledge, is much more authoritative science than comes from speculative knowledge. In fact, this is acknowledged by mainstream scientists also. They say, feel like archaeology or any kind of origins, origins of life. These are, we have a very small sample. We have a very, a very generic or very vague understanding of how things were in the past. And based on that, we have come up with certain understanding of how things evolved, things came about. So this is not to say that they are wrong. This is just to say that they are not as authoritative as we may think about based on our experience with other branches or other areas of scientific knowledge. So therefore, these two points that science and spirituality talk in different languages and science itself does not necessarily give us extremely authoritative knowledge about the remote past. So therefore, we needn't presume that the two narratives are entirely different. Our two narratives are entirely, two understandings of origin are entirely contradictory. The one understanding of spirituality is that there are various levels of reality. So for example, the story of Adam and Eve, which you mentioned. 
Even Christian theologians are often of the opinion that whether that theory, the story is literal or it is something other than literal, that, that is open to discussion. And even if certain narratives are, are, are to be considered in some ways historical, but they needn't have happened at this level of reality. Reality can be, seen, if we see it as multi-level, then things may, may, may function in a particular way at a particular level of reality. But they may function in a different way at another level of reality. I'll conclude this answer with, along, with another funny quote example. I don't want to make too abstract. Say somebody is playing a game of billiards. And now if we have a camera just above the billiards board, then we see, okay, this ball has gone into the hole over there. Now, why did that happen? If this stick came and hit this ball, that ball went and hit that ball, that ball went and hit that ball, that ball went into the hole. Now, we could explain why that ball went into the hole in terms of the laws of physics. Because this came and hit with this momentum at this angle, that's why the ball went into the hole. Okay. Now, that is a correct explanation. However, if we expanded the camera's frame and then we saw, hey, there is a, there is a player over here, an expert player, maybe the national billiard champion, and he hit the ball. So now, why did the ball go into the hole? Because this player is expert. So the, the explanation based on science, that the ball went into the hole because of laws of physics, we explained this is how it happened, and the explanation involving a personal agent is expert player. These two are not contradictory explanations. They are complementary explanations. Based on different frames of reference, we can have two different explanations. So similarly, take care. So uh, if we understand the science, so to conclude the answer, science and spirituality talk in two different languages. And the science answer could be correct, could be correct, but it needn't be definitive. In, in science, when you talk about origins, it's quite speculative. So we could have, based on the billiards example, that science can offer one explanation about the origin, which is at a particular level of reality, like why the ball went into the hole based on the billiards. And spirituality can offer us a different explanation based on another frame in which we are looking at things. So we don't have to necessarily see them as contradictory. They can be complementary. Uh, thank you so much, for, uh, Chetan Acharan, for this uh, answer, wonderful answer uh, and explanation. So, relating to this, uh, I have another question. Uh, so, Was the answer clear or you want to ask something more on this? Masha? Sorry, yeah, that answer was like really clear. It totally makes sense. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, my question, so uh, I am currently doing my PhD in artificial intelligence. Um, one of the topics is artificial intelligence. And uh, what we see right now is that, so till the middle of last decade, uh, the intelligence that was being developed in the labs was based off human intelligence. But currently the machines are being trained to be as, as good as or even better than humans in, cert in certain tasks. Um, but machines do not need to be spiritual to be efficient. So with the dawn of this new decade, do you think that uh, the relevance of spirituality will uh, decrease or uh, degrade in some sense? What are your takes on that? Yes, the artificial intelligence is a, again a big subject. But let me just quickly try to summarize. Machines are able to do many things that we thought in the past they would not be able to do. And in fact, not only are they able to do many things as well as we do, some of the things they are able to do much better than what we do. So, having said that, if we demystify machines, if we demystify robots or computers or any artificial intelligence module, Essentially, what are they doing? Basically, they are crunching numbers. They are dealing with bits. So now, if uh, you consider an ancient 
speak in some other language, say we consider the Mahabharat, which is in Sanskrit or something. So suppose somebody can read the Mahabharat super fast in English. The speed at which I can read it, say somebody can read it at not 10, 100 times faster than what we do. That would be impressive. But they are reading it at 100 times speed doesn't mean that they know Sanskrit. The speed in one area, even mind-boggling speed in one area, doesn't equate with proficiency or even basic ability in another area. So learning Sanskrit or learning Latin or some other language in which you can epic read, that's different from a super super speed, super competence in another area. So what machines do is basically they they process numbers at phenomenal speeds. And the capacity to process has become so much because of two main reasons. We have the microprocessor chips which have become miniaturized at an incredible level. And through the internet, we have an in to an incredible level of data. So the machines can have a lot of data and a lot of capacity to process. And that's why they can do things which, uh, which boggle the human mind. At the same time, what can they do? Basically, the two principles you could say, a machine can do everything that we can instruct it in its language to do. And a machine can't do anything more than that. That means if whatever is that, so generally machines can do very well something where there is a clearly defined task. Now, even before artificial intelligence, calculators could calculate numbers much better than what we do, much faster. Now we could have, say, for example, searching for data. We might have to search on an encyclopedia for hours and you just put something on Google immediately it gets. So what is it doing? It is basically processing information very, very fast. And now in the recent AI developments, we have there's facial recognition, there is speech recognition, text to speech to text is coming up. So there are developments. But in all of them, the computer, the AI module needs a clearly defined task. Without a clearly defined task, it it just comes to a dead end. So, for example, if you if you try to have a discussion with say Siri or Cortana or Alexa, what happens? The discussion might go on for a few minutes, and afterwards it will say that here is a list of websites that might have your answer. The problem here is a discussion does not have a clearly defined goal. Sometimes in discussion, sometimes some discussion might be very specific. Can you tell me, give me this so phone number? But sometimes discussions, they evolve as we move on. So much of what we humans do is not necessarily like linearly definable. So when we talk about general intelligence, general intelligence is the capacity to do intelligently do the various things that we humans generally do. Now, what all are the things that we do? And what comprises intelligence in doing those things? So none of this, or much of this, is not actually quantifiable in terms of the language of machines. So, so we will have more and more development of artificial intelligence and there are many areas in which uh, uh, robots will become much better than what they are now but in but they will all their improvement will all be in terms of specific super fast execution of really defined tasks but human life itself and the human intelligence is is not always based on clearly defined tasks so that's why if in science fiction, we may have robots acting like human beings, having consciousness, having emotions, making making conscious decisions. 
robot would be able to do that because all that is not translatable into their language. So sci-fi is very different from the reality of science. And uh, that's why spirituality, in terms of deciding what matters, the study of what matters, that is something which we human beings will have to do. And if robots seem to make decisions, that is that will be primarily based on the programming that has been given to them. So the programming could be by the original designer or it could be by the operator. But the robot that will make decisions, they are not making decisions on their own and they will never be able to make decisions on their own because it is they just crunching numbers. So we might have, say, if we design an intercontinental ballistic missile or a defense system for that. We might have it, almost 100% of it programmed in advance because we don't want a mistake by which a weapon of mass destruction will be destroyed, will be deployed unintentionally, deployed on the spur of the moment. So there we could have the, the robot will make a decision, but 100% of the decision would be based on the level-headed decision of the thinking of the designer. Or say if we have a, we have a drone which has a missile meant to kill a terrorist and it is an unmanned drone. Now, in that case, based on where the terrorist is running or hiding or whatever, we would want the operator to have a lot of control. Now, based on the input of the operator, the precision and the speed with which the drone will discharge the missile may, be, may far exceed what a human being does. But the decision is not taken by the drone. Or even if it appears the decision is taken by the drone, that is only an appearance. It's like a child who hears a musical orchestra being played in the, through a CD player and thinks, hey, is there an orchestra inside the CD player? No, the orchestra is not inside the CD player. The orchestra is played somewhere, it's recorded over there. So what we call as artificial intelligence is basically the recorded intelligence, either of the designer or of the operator, by which the robot operates. The study of what matters is will definitely matter all the time, even no matter how well uh, robots or artificial intelligence starts processing data and doing things thereby. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually had a question. Um, since you're so familiar because your background is, you know, being a monk, I'm sure that you've, you're very familiar with sort of like the ancient texts like Bhagavad Gita um, and other various texts. Um, so my question is pertaining to whether you can share some examples or instances where spirituality and science have come together um, to form sort of like a desirable human outcome for the society, whether you can think of any or anything that pertains to that. Thank you. That's a very good question, Malika. So actually, in fact, that was one of the things that prompted me to embark on a spiritual journey. Since my childhood, I had a great fascination with science. I used to read, not just study science, but read the biographies of science, bio scientists, and how they would do discovery. And I had a lot of faith in the power of scientific knowledge to improve humanity, to improve life, to improve the world. So, I, so with that almost idealistic notion, I chose not science per se, but engineering, because engineering was more applied, where we could make things better. When I was studying my engineering, I encountered several students who were much more brilliant than what I was. But uh, I found that they had some terrible habits. One of the students who had been a, who had topped the university in all the eight semesters of his engineering, he happened to be a chain smoker. So, now, you could say that smoking is a personal choice. It is, but I can figure out that this, this guy is so smart that he can figure out any electronics engineering problems. I, I did electronics engineering. Any electronics engineering problem in minutes, why can't I figure out that he's killing himself by smoking? And then he, at that time, got the highest paying job in the history of our college. But then, within six months of his working at that job, he was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. And then he passed away within a year. So, now, 
this was not uh, this one case was quite bad. bad. What struck me is that there is something inside us which sabotages us. And it was not just for him. I also was infamous for having a short temper. I would make a mess of small things because of that. So that science can provide us better resources by which we can build a better world. But something within us sabotages the use of those resources. What that means is that if we are to improve the world, we need not just better resources externally, but we need better self-restraint, better self-discipline, better greater virtues internally. And scientific knowledge itself does not generate those virtues. I'm not saying that scientists are not virtues. Many scientists are. But that virtuousness doesn't come from science itself. Science, as I said earlier, is, is immoral. So I felt that if, if we are to improve, if we are to actually improve the world, we, we need science to improve the outer world. But we also need something to improve the inner world. So at that same time, I was also part of a social welfare organization and I would go to nearby slums, that's the word we use in India, that underprivileged areas. And I would try to offer some free tuitions to the kids as a part of that organization. When I was talking with those kids, we became friends and they would tell me about their lives, home lives, and their lives were a mess. There was domestic violence, mostly because of alcoholism among the fathers. So when I talked with the fathers, they were grateful that I was coming to them and teaching their kids. And they seemed to be nice people. But then they used to that when they would drink, then they become, they become like a different person. So then I started thinking that how much uh, am I really helping these kids by teaching them math or English or history when their life is, uh, life is like this. And then we decided to diversify into uh, anti-alcoholism campaigning. We got some specialists to come and speak and guide. And in a small way, one locality uh, became alcohol free. We considered it a big success at that time. But after some time, and all of my friends went there and he came back devastated. And what happened? There were the local political elections and one of the candidates in order to woo the voters had come with several truck loads of free liquor for everyone. And not only the fathers, but even their kids had drunk. So that made me think again that there is again something inside us which works against us. And this seemed to be independent of one's level of education, of scientific education. These, these alcoholic fathers living in the slums were not very well educated. And then here I had an example of a friend who was who was highly educated, was one of the most brilliant students in one of the top institutes in India. And then I started exploring about the inner world. That's when I slowly discovered, I came across the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita in the third chapter, the 36th verse, asks this question, what is it that makes us act against our best interests? As if by force. So that question spoke to me. Even now, that is, I feel, one of the most relevant verses of the Bhagavad Gita. And then the Bhagavad Gita offers an understanding of the self-destructive forces within us, basically talks about the, the human feelings of lust, anger, greed, uh, envy, pride, and the arrogance, illusion. And it talks about how spiritual growth can help us uh, combat these feelings help us to purify ourselves. And as I started practicing practicing the Gita's uh, teachings, I found that my temper went down quite a bit. One of my friends, who, who was actually staying with my room partner, he was just sliding into alcoholism. He started practicing the principles of bhakti, and he just quit. And never turning back again. So I said, hey, this, is, this seems to work. This seems to transform me. 
when i started working in uh, i i graduated i was working in a software company as a, a software developer and then at that time i started exploring that how best can i contribute to society so i felt that it be i i, I once had a i was at that time i started giving some talks uh, to college students so then i had a talk but that evening just before i went to go for the talk my boss told me that we have a urgent project deadline you have to stay on and work today then i tried to arrange someone else to go for the talk but he couldn't work out out for the talk was cancelled then i started thinking at that time see, if i don't do this software program job, many others who will come up and do it but if i am not sharing spiritual wisdom how many other people are there for me so i felt that i could contribute much more to society by sharing spiritual wisdom which can help the develop growth of virtue and inner strength so that's what i have been trying to do over the last couple of decades i feel that science can make things better spirituality can make people better and that's how both science and spirituality can work together to make the world better Yeah, that's a really good conclusion and to like that whole thing. Um, I did have a question because like so far we were talking about science and spirituality and um, what is your take on humanity? Because I feel that humanity goes more hand in hand with spirituality than it does with science. Uh, do you agree with that? Okay, yes. So does humanity go more in hand in hand with spirituality than science? Yes, you could say especially the way science has developed it. in the recent times the human aspects of our lives have been to some extent devalued so like i talked about the primary properties of the science they are not be as what we human beings value love we want uh, we want to avoid pain we want to eat tasty food so many things like that so the humanity is deal with the often you could say the non quantifiable aspect of reality now i'm talking about humanities as a branch of knowledge but humanity itself when we humans live we live for things that are many of the things are provided for by science but as i said what we live with and what we live for so our human lives are defined not so much by what we live with they are also significantly defined by what we live for so we could say that for humanity science and spirituality are both distinct sources of knowledge and we need to avail of both of them for becoming a for holistic human development we need to draw from scientific knowledge we need to draw from spiritual knowledge also at present we do have a lot of scientific knowledge and we will be getting more and more but we do lack significant amount of spiritual knowledge martin luther king said this uh, almost half a century ago that our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power we have guided missiles and misguided men we have guided missiles we have scientific knowledge by which we can we can ha- control the world outside us but misguided men we don't have inner mastery to control the world within us so we do need to correct that imbalance by gaining more spiritual knowledge humanity will benefit by having the holistic integration of scientific knowledge and spiritual knowledge by which we can pursue our all round well being is that answer your question thank you um so do we proceed on to the next question or uh, do you think Okay. Uh, so my next question was that uh, about uh, mostly about rituals. So uh, being uh, born and brought up in Indian households, uh, we have uh, come across a lot of rituals. Uh, some of which are scientific, and some of which uh, do not make a lot of sense. You know, some of them are superstitions. Uh, so is it? I mean, how do we uh, distinguish between superstition and a scientific ritual? And is accepting anything without uh, reasoning uh, unscientific or what are your takes on that 
and how are rituals scientific or spiritual? Okay, so are rituals scientific? Should we accept them without reasoning? No, not at all. If we consider the Bhagavad Gita itself, it concludes not with a call for subordination or obedience, it concludes with a call for contemplation. Or deliberate on what I have spoken and then do as you desire. So the Gita does not at all recommend blind following and it is not afraid of deep thinking or reason. In fact, although Krishna is God, there is nowhere in the Gita where Krishna says, I am God, therefore you have to obey. Krishna gives an elaborate reasoning. Uh, for why what he is recommending will be beneficial. So, it, the, the principle over there is that we use our reason to understand uh, how things work and then we practice. At the same time, we also recognize that the reason alone may not answer all questions. So, there is, we could say there is rational, there is irrational. And there is transrational. Transrational means not that it is below rationality, it is above rationality. Say, for example, if you were you were fallen sick, and uh, you your mother said, "I will stay next to you right throughout the night." Uh, now the doctor may say, "Actually, you know, we are given a uh, sleeping medication. He's not going to wake up." You might say, no, there's no need for you to say, you can go and take, there's a bed nearby, you can sleep over there, you'll be, you'll come back. No, you know, I want to be with him in case he needs me. Now, her, the, that loving care, is it irrational? From a rational perspective, there's no need for you to be here. But you know, that love, that is an expression of love. And that's not irrational, that's transrational. And now, in fact, there's a, there's a quite a, provocatively worded scientific study, it is called as where science and spirituality kiss each other. So what is that study about? Let's say that there are two partners and one of them is very sick. And the other partner is always with them and offering good wishes, prayers, and basically radiating positive emotional energy toward them. Now you cannot quantify the positive energy. But all that, what you can quantify is that the control book, where, the control group where there was no one offering those good wishes and prayers, and another control, another group that this was offered, and they found that the person who, who were well, the people who were offered such good wishes, positive emotional energy, they, they healed faster and better. How did that happen? You might not have a rational understanding in terms of rational as mathematically measurable parameters. So there is transrational. So that means we don't reject reason, but we don't limit ourselves to reason alone all the time, to rationality alone all the time. So with that background, if you look at rituals now, you remember I mentioned about the bottom of the mountain and top of the mountain, and spiritual growth means going up from the bottom to the top. So various traditions, spiritual traditions across the world have come up with certain practices that are meant to help raise human consciousness from the material to the spiritual level. So, now those practices are sometimes called as rituals. So, if those practices are done with a proper understanding of why we are doing them, then they can help raise one's consciousness up to the spiritual level. Along with that, in every tradition, there are many other practices that may have come up, which, as you said, could be superstitions. They don't really help in raising one's consciousness. So then, uh, should we just, uh, we needn't accept all rituals, neither, nor we should, neither we should we reject all rituals. We can adopt the Bhagavad Gita's approach, deliberate, ask questions. Now, why should I do this? If you are if you're telling me to do this, I do this. And if we get good answers for that, then that will give us intellectual conviction to do those activities. So I would say it's based on merit rather than a generic answer. We look at 
the particular practice and see what its purpose is and how will that purpose is served by our doing it. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So, I guess that um, in the last hour we talked like lots about the science and spirituality and um, different ways. So basically, for me, some takeaways were that science is something that you live with and spirituality is something that you live for. And the fact that like artificial intelligence, you can't really like there will nothing. I don't think there will ever come something, at least in our lifetime, that's going to replace human human discussion. Because like you said, when you have a discussion with a person, you don't have a goal. And I think that that's something like very spiritual in a sense and not that that's not something that can be replaced. So um, do you have any final thoughts on anything? Thank you for summarizing. Well, both of you all small look and yes, you summarize what or something, some carry home for you. Then I quickly finish. Yeah, so I actually, um, in terms of the rituals uh, question, what, what you just spoke about right now, I think that is something that I've always questioned as well and not necessarily struggled with, but uh, not completely understood the whole point of, you know, following certain practices. Um, but I think you explained it really well in the sense that it's sort of like regulation. So it's kind of like, you know, if you want to be able to understand something that is of a higher understanding or of, on a different scale, then these maybe these things are in place for you to be able to achieve that or for you to be able to get closer to that. So that is something that I took away. Um, I also took away Masha's point in terms of human to human interaction because we see it that it's happening in the workforce as well now. Like we see it happening in banks. We see that, you know, even in the work sort of the field that I'm in, we see within HR that there's robots that are coming in that are taking sort of like the simple HR tasks that used to be done by people, but now all these robots are coming in. Um, and it is definitely a place of not worry, but it's a place of questioning in the sense like, how is this going to be able to shape the world for the better or for the worse? But I think your perspective on spirituality and um, emphasizing the point that those machines are there ultimately because they're wired by humans at the end of the day. So they'll only be able to function with the information that we've given to them, um, which I thought was really interesting as well. And also emphasizing the fact that, especially I think if you're sharing spiritual knowledge with someone, um, that richness of that discussion is not going to be the same if a robot is telling you the same thing, because it's not gonna have, you know, like it's the emotions and the way you express certain things is going to be very different. So I just, those were my takeaways. Uh, Tanuja, if you want to add as well to what we've said so far. Yeah, um, what Marsha and Malvika said, um, those are definitely the main takeaways. And something else that actually struck a chord with me was uh, the thing that you mentioned about uh, the material platform and the spiritual platform and how um, um, spirituality is... Uh, it's actually designed to take us from the lower platform to the higher platform and that spirituality is not about changing the surroundings around us it's about changing ourselves from within uh, so i think these are the two additional takeaways along with those of masha and Malika. And thank you thank you a lot thank you very much to summarize everything that i spoke <laughs> uh, thank you for your thoughtful questions and your participation Wonderful being with you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank, thank you, you so you much. And, the time. Yeah, and thank you, Masha. Thank you, Tanuje. Thank you for everyone that's tuning in for this talk all over the world. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that you guys could have spent the last hour with us. Um, and thank you so much, Chaitanya Churn, for taking such wonderful and um, time of yours to share such brilliant questions um, and answers to these questions. So we'll be doing this again. Um, just keep a lookout. It, they usually happen every Saturday, 8 p.m. Indian time. Um, but for now, I guess we'll say goodbye to our wonderful speaker and say goodbye to our wonderful panelists. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.